My guest today is Representative Logan Phillips, Northeastern Oklahoma, and in town for the redistricting special session. Good to have you, Representative Phillips. I appreciate you inviting me on, Scott. Hey, it's good. always good to see you. We've talked before. Our audience has seen you before. What we have not had before is a the ink dried and signed by both houses of uh, Congress and the president. The infrastructure deal, the infrastructure bill is now law. And we have talked about this for some time. The discussion has been what if. So now we know what's there. And very few people I've talked to, Representative Phillips, know precisely what's in that bill <laughs> for Oklahoma. And we had a good time with this. I said, I think the last time we visited, I said, you know, the legislative, our, our delegation is going to be against this. And I'd put it to you. I said, we still going to spend the money. And the every response single was, cent. <laughs> every single cent. So that, that doing that's a whole different discussion. The fact is, is it's headed here in o to Oklahoma. And you are sitting in a position that it's going to be affecting a couple of uh, a lot of areas here in terms of infrastructure. One of those is you're a member of the Mental Health Caucus, but as importantly, equally importantly, you're chair of a committee that's really taking actually two committees mm -hmm. that are going to be looking at how best to spend this money on behalf of Oklahomans. So the committees you're on uh, deal with ARPA funds. And as I recall, that's the money that came out of the American Relief Plan uh, yes. money. And then there's a separate bill, which is the infrastructure bill. Take us through those two funds, if you could, at a 10,000 foot level as to what is happening with those in Oklahoma. Absolutely. Uh, so we are in, you know, the last time we spoke, I thought maybe the state of Oklahoma would get 30, 40 million dollars through ARPA funded COVID relief funding that we could build out some broadband and the rest of it be focused on those traditional infrastructures. And that's that's just not the case uh, with the ARPA funding. The state of Oklahoma received about one point nine billion dollars. And that's just for the legislator to uh, our legislative body to actually partner out. You can add in things like the uh, tribal monies that came in for the sovereign nations. The county monies uh, came out to about one point three billion together with all the county monies. It's a tremendous amount of funds just for the ARPA with a tremendous amount of them earmarked for broadband uh, because the, the federal government finally defined broadband connectivity as a traditional infrastructure. Now, we have the second bill setting out, which is the one point two trillion with a T dollar infrastructure bill uh, that just passed out of the House, the Senate and was signed by President Biden, uh, I believe yesterday, uh, either morning or afternoon, I'm not real sure. And in that, uh, we are earmarked tremendously for broadband, not just for the state, but here in Oklahoma. And the numbers are all over the place. You're right. The, the numbers are changing daily, but we do have some minimum numbers. We know that out of that $1.2 trillion, the state of Oklahoma is going to get at least a bare minimum of $100 million just for broadband expansion. And then we have another $163 million in a capital expenditures fund that is pretty much earmarked for broadband as well. And then we have a, a bunch of little pots that are going to serve those uh, historically unserved or underserved areas, places that have never had connectivity. Uh, we have $2.7 billion uh, for the nation going to digital literacy uh, to help with our senior citizens, to help with uh, new up and coming students to learn how to connect for the first time and learn how to use those computers. Uh, we have $32.2 billion specifically for the rural areas to throw out broadband into just areas that have never had connectivity before. Of course, that statewide number or nationwide numbers, at, but historically Oklahoma has always received about 1% of these uh, national figures. So if we're talking national figures of 4.25 billion, that's 42 more million. Uh, 32 billion for the historic unserved areas, that's 32 extra million. These quickly add up to pots of like 500 to $750 million just for broadband expansion once this all is settled and looking out and that's not looking at stuff like the USDA grants, uh, the, the NFIT grants, uh, other types of grant systems that are out there that also have billions of dollars in them. So we're going to see boots on the ground, the single largest infrastructure build out in the state's history. Uh, this is going to blow that 1920s rural electrification out of the water. Uh, it's going to be like un anything we've ever seen before. They're talking about figuring out a way to make connectivity to every single home now. 
All right, let me uh, read a headline to you. Uh, uh, our friend uh, Trey Savage over at Nondoc had a individual who did uh, named Joyce Sloan, who's a mental health provider, did a uh, commentary for Nondoc the other day. This was back in uh, late October. The headline was "Limited Broadband Access Jeopardizes Mental Health," and in this, she says. The gap between those who broadband access in Oklahoma and those who don't has been widening for a long time. Goes on to say that U.S. Census data, we're one of the least connected states in the union, and we have a exploding problem with uh, mental health, um, mental illness. Rather, we're seeing all, well, we're seeing a, a meth explosion across Oklahoma. So Monday night we were talking with the docs about telehealth and expanding this. You see this. You're a member of that mental health caucus. You see what's happening here. How quickly can you get this deployed? How will you decide how it's going to be deployed? And a commentary from you as to just how bad the problem is in Oklahoma in terms of mental health, education, those sorts of things, Representative Phillip. Well, let's start off with the commentary first. Uh, The reality is uh, Oklahoma has about 30 percent of our population suffering from some form of mental health uh, problem, uh, depression, suicidal thoughts, uh, those uh, addiction based issues. It is tremendously large amount of population. We're talking 400,000 plus people of our Oklahoma population. We're 31 in the nation in mental health. Uh, that's a terrible number to have. But the reality is we're 80 percent of our physical land mass is unserved by connectivity. Uh, 385,000 of our students don't have Internet connectivity at home. There's no ability for them to reach out through telehealth uh, to get those mental health services. Um, Last session, I actually passed a resolution naming the month of November, where we're at right now, as men's health awareness, to raise health awareness for mental health, prostate cancer, those type of things, because we see that the suicide rates, especially in our young teens during this pandemic the last two years, has simply skyrocketed. The isolation, the uh, the lack of control in the lives, uh, these have led people, uh, the loss of jobs and livelihoods to start uh, destroying their own lives, to start taking their own lives. Uh, the mental health crisis is peaking, uh, not just in here in Oklahoma, though we are one of the worst, it's peaking across the nation and it's not getting better. Um, now, there are some ways we can take and deal with the situation. Uh, one of the big problems is we simply don't have mental health services in our rural communities. You get outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma City to be able to get to a therapist or a psychologist or anyone to speak to is extremely difficult. Um, when you have no cell phone coverage and you have no Internet connectivity and you can't have a doctor that's in the town, What's your opportunity? Uh, you're going to turn to things like meth. You're going to turn to abusing substances. Uh, you're going to turn to those things that quiet the demons in your head and quiet those voices and those awful fa- thoughts you're having. Um, so if we're going to overcome that, we have to be looking at this connectivity issue so that we can bring in doctors, not just from here in Oklahoma, but from everywhere to get resources to our elderly are suffering horribly. Uh, we're seeing massive spikes in the uh, retirement communities and to the, uh, the elder homes because they have been blocked off from their loved ones for almost two years now. Um, so we have to find new and creative ways to bring in those resources, bring back that human connection and start treating these issues. You know, one of the things that's probably underreported uh, is that the if we have these sorts of numbers amongst the general population on mental illness and challenges right now, our correctional facilities have got to be have, if not more, percentage of those same sorts of problems. I know in Oklahoma County, we've been talking about uh, some improvements at the jail that go virtually unnoticed amongst general media, and I'm wondering. Are there things in this bill that would allow you to go into these facilities, which have an enormously, according to reports, enormously high amount of people with mental health challenges to get some treatment? Although I know that's a difficult thing for mental health providers so to get due treatment inside of uh, incarcerated uh, in, in, in sort of uh, correction facilities. But do you see something there in terms of this money, this infrastructure money helping in that regard? Well, absolutely. Uh, we have the money's earmarked for COVID release, relief. And then, of course, the infrastructure money is made there earmarked to build out those systems that we need. Uh, so there's tremendous pots of money for dealing with mental health and the, uh, the prison population. I'm, 
the reality is in Oklahoma, since 1983, our population has increased about 276%. Uh, we have about 26,000 or so people in the Oklahoma judicial system that are uh, justice involved right now. And you're right, the mental health issues there are tremendous. Uh, but the depression issues are the same just in our population uh, with higher numbers. Um, the lack of hope is a huge thing. So one of the things in the ARPA inside the COVID is ability to create workforce programs. Uh, some of those prisoners to help with recidivation, recidivation rates, uh, we can actually create employees from them, uh, train them to skills so that when they get out of prison, they have hope of a better life that they can become contributing members of society. Um, in the tech field, we have negative 22% unemployment rate right now. There is nothing stopping one of our justice involved individuals from learning how to run fiber lines, run, learning how to do cutting edge broadband and connectivity technology, getting out of the prison and having a career path that is successful. And we know that if you can get somebody to work, that they're making money, they're being successful, that their children are going to be better off. There's going to be less likelihood of that multi-generational justice involvement. So there's fingers of this that's going to go and branch out in a variety of different ways, but there's absolutely money there to help in the prison populations to break down those recidivation rates and help that, uh, though that particular population get to be members of our society. When you say prisons, does that also include, I mean, I guess you're talking DOC, but how about counties? I, I see nothing from what my readings is that would restrict that in any way, shape or form. I think we can reach into those counties uh, just as easily as we can reach to the DOC facilities and start seeing them as valuable and uh, training them as such. Does it all frustrate you as somebody who's working in the tech field, but you're also working in the mental health field, that there seems to be very little attention to the details on this. Now, I know we're a very busy society. But some of this is incredibly important, it affects a lot of lives, and yet there's a virtual, it seems to be almost a blackout, not on purpose, because there are things happening each and every day. But the details of this are incredibly important to Oklahomans, and yet there does not seem to be deep dives where people can can engage on these topics. Oh, uh, there has historically been in almost every single legislative body across the nation this need to be tough on crime. Now. In the last three years, five years here at the Capitol, that idea is starting to change. Uh, one, we found out it's super expensive. It's expensive to punish uh, mental health issues as criminals. It's expensive to house people uh, to be justice involved. And so once we started looking at the financials of it, now we're starting to have those conversations. In fact, I'm a founding member of the Mental Health Caucus. Uh, of a group of Republican and Democrat legislators that are bicameral, bipartisan, of how we can deal with these issues. So the conversation is starting to change, but we're looking at generations of just punishing mental health uh, instead of treating the illness, treating the root problems and trying to break those generational issues. But it's gonna take extreme amount of time and legislators that are willing to jump in and have those extremely tough conversations. And um, but I do think that system is starting to change and we will see those conversations happening in bigger and bigger pictures. Do you think that people like me that uh, work with media need to step up our game in terms of, you can have these messages, but if media is not covering these messages, how does it get out to the public? Absolutely. Uh, a perfect example, the uh, Movember Foundation, the state of Oklahoma, partnered with them for this month of November for men's mental health and physical health awareness, uh, raising awareness for suicide rates, for prostate cancer, for all these types of things. It has been an act of God to try to get this message out that the state is actively pursuing help in the mental health field for men who are suffering from these issues. Um, it makes my job of helping the individuals tremendously easier if I have the media on my side, but it's not always a glorious, great, catchy headline when you talk about mental health. A lot of times, Members of society have had family members. They've had been victims of issues uh, with domestic assault, violence uh, from these mental health issues. And those conversations are tough to have. Uh, they don't read real well. And it's tough to dive into them all the way and find out the root cause is not something we can just throw money at. It's something we have to break a generational problem and start treating the root cause of. All right, so this money, where is it right now? How long do you think it will be before it can start being deployed in the state of Oklahoma? This is something we'll have to wait until the legislative session for 
um, for the appropriation process? Absolutely not. Uh, so with the COVID relief money that came originally, of course, that went to the governor's office and that was dispersed, what, nine months ago, 10 months ago. Um, with the ARPA funding that has, a bit, I believe that half the pot has already been sent to the state of Oklahoma. We have an ARPA meeting tomorrow, uh, this tomorrow afternoon, where we will be looking at taking their initial grant proposals, sending them to the subcommittee and starting to work through those issues of excuse me, getting that money out uh, to the population and starting those projects. We're looking at it now. Uh, the reality is every state received this money and we have issues with workforce and supply line issues. So we have to be first to the market. So we're not waiting till session starts or the end of May. The work began a few months ago. It's currently ongoing and that money is coming out to start those projects now so that we can fix the issue that's directly in front of us. Representative Logan Phillips, it's always enjoyable to talk with you. You're especially frank, which by the way, can get you in trouble in politics to be completely forthright about your answers. And you're always, uh, I think that's just something that's really refreshing about you. And I understand why that you really have been the point person for Speaker McCall, who this is a huge issue for Speaker McCall. And I know for you, and we're very grateful for your time. And listen, on these issues that you want to talk about, we're here for you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you giving me a meeting to do so. Thank you very much. Representative Logan Phillips for being with us today. Talk to you soon.